حشبان Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yes. Is... Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council um, Climate, and Envir Climate and Environment Advisory Committee. Um, I'm Jeff Harvey. I'm a member of Borsham. I'm also vice chair of the committee. Um, unfortunately, the chair. Councillor Pippa Halings is stuck in traffic, but I think she may be joining and taking over from me when, when she arrives. But in the meantime, I'll get things going. Um, so I think we, we are core it in, in the chamber, um, so we, we can continue. Um, I don't know, um, Patrick, do we have any apologies for absence? I, I guess we do have some. No, as the chair, we haven't uh, received any apologies yet, uh, apart from, as you said, that the chair, we, we know, will be late. Okay. Um, just say here we've... Oh, no, no this is... Um, yeah, okay. Um, any declarations of interest? No, okay. Um, okay, uh, so now on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, and can I just take that page by page and... And if anyone has a point to raise on the minutes, maybe they could uh, let me know. So page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, and page six. Okay, so could I start actually by welcoming Paul Fairpark to the committee and um, congratulations to your successful election. Um, now, I think the next item on the agenda would be matters arising. Um, are there any matters arriving from the previous minutes? Councillor Harvey, I have an update from Peter Campbell um, on the uh, the action around uh, setting up a working group for um, which SEAC members can be part of, uh, arising from the housing assets management strategy that he talked about at the last meeting. So uh, Peter says, we've just introduced a new way of working with tenants and he will be asking volunteers from them this week. He's also aware that he's that that they are looking at a new repairs contract, which also involves tenant, and he doesn't want to overburden them. So um, I guess that's a yes. This is this is happening, but um, it's 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 yet to come. Yes, very good. Um, so unless there's anything else, um, is it um, Siobhan or are you taking the next item, or is it Emma? The um, item five of the agenda. Uh, it's Emma, who I believe is here. Is that right? Okay. Well, over yes. to you then, Emma. So um, this will just be a, a summary of our excellent um, climate and environment fortnight, which which I thought was a tremendous success. And, and well done, Emma, indeed. Um, I, I thought it was splendid. So um, if you'd like to talk us through it. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Just bear with me for two seconds. Um, Okay, can everybody see the table that I provided? Is that showing? Yes. Yes, that is. Okie dokie. So um, I would like to give an update on the recently held <coughs> climate and environment fortnight of events. Um, so I'd like to prevent, provide members with a brief update on the climate and environment fortnight of events held in February and March of this year. The free events aimed at a variety of audiences took place from the 25th of February until the 5th of March, 
to help people think about how to live more sustainably, reduce carbon emissions and in turn have, help tackle climate change. We decided to partner with various organisations who were able to offer their expert advice and tips whilst also allowing for audience participation. This method of delivery did not require extensive resource to put on and demonstrates the benefits of online events in terms of officer time and accessibility. The table that you can see shows the webinars that we provided, the partners we partnered with and the number of attendees and page views. Um, so as you can see, these figures highlight the benefits of online events. Um, these recordings um, obviously were from February, so I'm, I'm expecting that figures would have gone up since then. Um, and the recordings and information from these events indicated um, the Council's involvement that were also featured in the Solutions Fair as part of the prestigious Earth Optimism events organised annually by Cambridge Conservation Initiative. And that ran from the 26th of March until the 4th of April 2021. And this involvement increased our viewing, to um, viewing totals further still. So I would like to invite the Climate Environment Advisory Committee to note the delivery of the Climate Environment fortnight of online events and or highlight any concerns or comments. And um, if you agree um, that we could repeat the fortnight again next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have to apologise. I, I realise I missed um, item five on the agenda. Um, was, was that Siobhan who was going to comment on our success? Yeah. I think Councillor Hailings was just going to, to, to note this, but um, okay, well, as wait. you can see from the background, I've actually come into the office today and I have discovered the missing certificate, which we couldn't find. So here we go. I hope you can see that. Um, this is a certificate of excellence awarded by the IESE, um, who do a lot of work on transforming local public services. And this is awarded to the council for our... Um, being green to our core um, programme of works. Well, well done. And well done. I, think, I mean, I think that was um, probably as a result of quite a lot of um, time and effort uh, filling in the application form, as with all these events. So uh, well done, everyone involved in that. Um, OK. Um, I don't know whether I just feel um, I should say a little bit more about um, just following on from Emma's. I, and I just um, I felt that that fortnight really um, inspired so many people and kicked off um, so many, and especially, I mean, that amazing film that we, we all saw, um, talking about new techniques in agriculture and um, direct drilling, um, cover cropping. And I think um, that's really set a lot of um, people thinking about um, the possibilities of the future. So I, I just, um, Emma, want to sort of thank you again, but I thought it was uh, just um, terrific fortnight. Um, okay, right. So um, now uh, item seven. Um, oops, sorry to interrupt, Chair. I think we do. We need to say well, we want to have that event again next year. I think that was just a, a decision for the minute. I apologise. I think it was probably accepted as, as, as we were going to do that. But just want to make sure. I, uh, okay. Um, so um, well. So, so so shall I just um, express a wish that we will we will have the same um, event next year. Okay. And now we've got item seven. So um, do we have Katie Williams, Williams there to um, talk about the um, Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill? Hi, hi, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm here along with um, my teammate Serena from uh, UK Youth Climate Coalition. So Serena is going to give a bit of an overview about what UK YCC does, and then I can talk a little bit about the CE bill. Okay, welcome. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming to talk about this. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Go on, Serena. All right, amazing. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Katie, for the little introduction. So my name is Serena, and I have been a part of the UK Youth Climate Coalition for five years now very long time and it's the most amazing NGO I have ever come across. So what it is, is a space for UK young people aged 18 to 29 to engage in climate action on different levels, local, national and international. Um, and we're a non-profit NGO 
Our mission is to empower and mobilize young people to take positive action for climate justice. And we have lots of uh, different values surrounding um, anti-oppression, transparency, all about youth voices and ampli amplification of um, inclusivity, diversity, these kind of different things. Uh, a bit about UKYCC itself, we're split into four different working groups and then on top of this also an operations team. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the first two, which is systems change and the COP working group. And then Katie will talk about the other two, which is communications and community. Uh, okay, so first let's start with systems change. This is not my working group, but it's just one of the amazing ones. And systems change is all about, um, I guess, going right down to the very, very core of the issue and recognizing that climate and the climate emergency is very, very deeply rooted in political biology. And it's really looking at the issues within climate justice perspective and looking at it um, with the recognition that's tied in a so so I could hear myself, um, that's tied and associated with climate change. And it, it, it looks at things like capitalism and again, these values that I already talked about, anti-oppression and this kind of thing. Um, I guess one really, really cool campaign that just happened was one, it was a prank campaign around, uh, and I just, I want to highlight it because it's so interesting, in Cornwall. So um, it was highlighting the hypocrisy of the UK government doing uh, fossil fuel extraction in uh, Mozambique. And what this was, was a completely fake fabricated campaign of fossil fuel extraction in St. Ives in Cornwall. Um, and there was a fake protest, fake Facebook page, a fake uh, brochure thing that was spread around to all the local residents and gained a lot of traction in this way. Um, and then of course it was completely fake. So then once it was then found out, all the residents were contacted and then directed to the actual issue in Mozambique. Um, so this is just one example of something that this working group works on. Uh, a bit about the working group that I, is my home, the COP working group. COP is short for Conference of the Parties in the United Nations Climate Change Space. Um, so what we do is we go to the UN, we go to UN climate conferences. Uh, so we're doing loads and loads of mobilizing and activism for COP26. really push for the youth voice and really we're kind of like there are the ones pushing for the I guess the moral compass you know and just pushing um for raised ambition and as high ambition as possible um so it's yeah super super amazing and really really excited to work with this organization always have been because it's so fantastic uh, I will now pass on to Katie to tell you a bit more about some other working groups yeah, so the two working groups that I'm part of are the communications and the community teams. Um, so communications is kind of what it says on the tin. We do all the social media stuff and we run blog series, things like that. Um, and then the community team is the first team that I joined in UK YCCB. Um, and we do more sort of, you know, activities within our local communities, which has been a bit harder to do virtually over the last year or so. Um, so our main project over the last year has been um, We've developed a website where people can look up their MPs voting record on particular climate change bills. Um, so the CEE bill is on there. So you will note that our MP Anthony Brown is not supporting the CEE bill just yet. Um, yeah, and so you can look on there, find out, you know, oh, my MP did vote for the Climate Change Act in 2008, but they didn't vote for this thing. And then you can write to them and say, ah, oh, I see that you did this. That was really good. Maybe you could do more, you know, support the CEE bill, do something else. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a good way of getting people to sort of think about how they can engage in different ways because, you know, it's, you know, protests and things are one way that people can engage with the climate movement. But at the same time, it's important to be engaging directly with MPs and asking, asking them to do more. Um, so, yeah, and onto this CEE bill, which is kind of how I ended up here. Um, so UK, UKYCC has partnered with the um, CEE bill campaign team. Um, so we are supporting the climate and ecological emergency bill um, and I wrote to my local councillor about it and that's how I've ended up being invited to this meeting so thank you for having us uh, yeah, asking you guys to support the CEE bill which basically the bill sort of aims to fill in a lot of the gaps that we currently have in climate and environmental legislation so um, you've got the 2008 climate change act which asks us to you know, 
reduce our emissions based on 1990 levels, um, but then those emissions don't include things like international aviation or the emissions from all of the goods that we import that sort of gets dumped on other countries, usually poorer countries than Britain who don't actually have, you know, the right infrastructure to either reduce emissions quickly or to, you know, uh, deal with the impacts that climate change is already having on their communities. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of other stuff in it. Um, one of the main things uh, it involves a citizens assembly, so that would kind of help inform, um, yeah, how there'll be a citizens assembly made up of like a range of people from all over the country who would then get, you know, advice from a panel of experts and then they would make suggestions to the government about how they should tackle the climate and ecological emergency. And the main thing, which I should have said, which is really important about this bill, is that it kind of it recognises that climate change and other ecological problems are really linked and, you know, they're all part of the same problem because often it's like, oh, yeah, let's reduce climate change. We don't necessarily think about how how that impacts biodiversity and other issues. So it's kind of trying to ask the government to have a more integrated approach to how we tackle environmental problems. Um, I think that's all I have to say about this. So if anyone has any questions for either me or Serena, fire away. Well, thank you very much for that. Good. Are, are there any um, questions? I, um, I do note that um, our chair, Pippa Halings, has just arrived in the chamber. I don't know whether this is a good moment to um, swap around, Pippa. So you, um, if everyone can just um, uh, be patient for a few seconds. Hello, I'm really, really sorry for being late. I was delayed in traffic. I've just come up from Yorkshire. I'm looking after doing some caring for my mum. So the fact that we have to do in-presence, in-person meetings means I can't juggle so easily all the different things. But I did hear the great thing about technology is while I was, um, I could hear everything that you were saying in the beginning of the meeting as well um, while I was driving. So first of all, can I just say, Hello to everybody, apologies, apologies. And thank you so much to Serena and Katie for coming here and really bringing this message to us, which you've heard very clearly. And to Serena, what I'd just like to say in terms of the COP26 working group that you're in, very much we'd like to know a little bit more. I will be at COP26 accredited, not through the council, but through my professional work, but we are hoping to be able to showcase local council work at COP26. And so it would be very, very nice to know what are the messages that you have that you think are very, very specific to local government and any that you would like us to raise to national government as well in COP26. So please do let us know either now or um, later any way that we can take that forward because we do agree with you that this is about transformational societal change. So. Um, very, very good. And I had seen that protest that was in Cornwall, very innovative. So um, well done. And Katie, in terms of the CEE bill, and that has been brought to us by Councillor Peter Fane, um, and it is something that we've looked at and we want it to be brought here to, to the committee to look at going forward as a motion to full council. There are councils around the country that have already put this forward as a, as a motion to their council to see whether they support that. Um, and I'd like to know sort of what, what other members of the committee feel about that, because that is what we do and, and analyze here carefully. I've also read the response of the MP for the city, you know, um, Daniel Zeichner and also MP Anthony Brown, um, their response to this. So I'd, I'd really open this up to the committee now. It's a serious point on the agenda that we've brought forward. And thank you very much for Katie bringing that towards us. As you'll know, we have declared both a climate and an ecological emergency here. So we've linked the two from the very beginning. We've got a zero carbon strategy and we've just adopted a doubling nature strategy, which we call the sister document. So if you look at those two documents, one is the zero carbon. and It does make some reference to adaptive ways, the natural resource ways in which we're looking at adaptation. But the doubling nature strategy says they're interlinked. We, they're, you know, they're indivisible, these two emergencies, and we need to look at both of them, which is why we've, we've linked together and twinned together these two documents. And today, during this committee meeting, you will see that the action plans for both of those strategies are merging into one for us as a council now. So we're actually showing you that everything we look at, 
will be through this twin lens that, that's inexplicably interlinked. And um, what we have viewed, and we've looked at the, the proposed motion that you, draft motion that you sent to us, as a proposed motion to us, um, and our view at the moment is we do support absolutely in principle what is there in the motion in terms of the CEE bill. We think there are definitely ways in which um, ambition can be pushed on both of these agendas, and we do think that they need to be, um, I think going back to Serena's point, there needs to be this transformational shift to being holistic and much more integrated in, in the two of them. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to, to that item. Um, as I understand it, the bill depends upon one MP taking forward in the private membership bills. I don't know that one has so far adopted it. But, um, uh, and it seemed unlikely at the present that the government would take it forward. What ways, what avenues do you see to taking it forward? How do you see that, um, how do you propose to <laughs> um, persuade the other ways of persuading government to actually take it on or a private member, uh, private member to take it on? Um, well, I think the, the local council support is quite an important one in terms of getting individual MPs to change their mind, because I think that demonstrates that there's, there is local support for the issue. Um, yeah, because I think, you know, Anthony Brown in particular has come out quite strongly against the CEE bill. Um, but I mean, they have, um, that's something actually that I perhaps should raise. I've also written an open letter to Anthony Brown that if anyone is interested in signing, drop me an email. I can put my email in the chat and I can send it to you. Um, but yeah, I think kind of the more the more people we get behind it, the more likely the government is to to kind of change their mind and the more people we can engage to sort of approach their MP, particularly if their MP is, you know, in government and currently opposed to the bill. I think the main CEE bill team are trying to work with a few conservative MPs because the, um, so it was introduced as a private members bill in the last parliament session and then that session ended and it's restarted in May. And um, they're looking to reintroduce the bill in a slightly different way to last time and it's been redrafted. So actually, some of the things that were in it that um, Anthony Brown was against have kind of been take, taken out or sort of changed a bit. So actually, I think there's more of a case to get him to change his mind now. Um, yeah, sorry, I hope that answered your question. In fact, uh, among the members of this committee, I think all of us represent um, wards that's actually in uh, the, the constituency of uh, Lucy Fraser. Have you had any contact with her? Sorry, of who? Uh, the, the MP for South and Southeast Cambridgeshire Southeast. Um, the South Cambridgeshire covers uh, two constituencies. Uh, the majority oh. is in uh, Anthony Brown, right. but we're Sorry. in <laughs> a lot of actually also in Southeast Cambridgeshire. Oh, okay. Um, I haven't because I'm in I'm in South Cambridgeshire constituency. I haven't really engaged with the Southeast Cambridgeshire constituency yet. But yeah, I can look into that. <laughs> I think it would just be the same. So you'd be actually, you know, providing the same kind of information to both of the MPs, and and we have councils, as Martin says, that cover both of those constituencies within South Camps District Council. It covers both constituencies in quite a way. So it could be an approach to to both. Does anybody have any thing they want to say about this in particular? No. Um, and so I think that what I would like to recommend to all the members of this committee is that we review do you have a copy of the newly drafted ce because i haven't seen any new drafts um yeah i can i can send a link in the chat can you do that please and so what i'd like i'd like that we should all see the new draft because we can't ask to do anything on the basis of the of you know a draft that we haven't seen yet so i would like to recommend that you know following this meeting we all review the the new draft and also the proposed motion that i think councillor peter fain has drafted which will be for full council. So we need to check both of those documents together and then to provide any comments to us about whether you support that or not. But what I would like to say is that we absolutely welcome activists like you to come here and talk to us and speak a bit of truth to power and tell us what you think we should be doing as your councillors and as the committee you know, that does have power over policy and indirect policy. You know, powers over indirect policy too. So thank you so much for your time um, and speaking to us and we will get back to you as soon as everybody's reviewed the draft document and the draft motion.
Thanks for having us. No, thank you. And Serena, as I say, do get, get in contact with us about COP26 as well. Thank you. Yeah, that would be fab. Thank you so much. No, thank you for everything you're doing. That's fantastic, really. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move on to, if you want to stay listening in, then please do, and you can hear about the rest of the work that we're doing. In fact, what we've got are two things which are really important around um, biodiversity and chalk streams and waste, waste strategy, um, and then also our action plan, which brings the two together. So, please be, do feel free to stay. And we'll go to agenda item number eight, which is the biodiversity supplementary planning document. And do we, John, are you with us? John Cornell? I'm indeed. Hello, John. Hello. How are you? Very well, thanks. And you? Good. Hello, Jane. That's Jane Green is with us as well, who's the head of um, Built Natural Environment in the Planning Service. Thank you very much. Do you want to introduce us to the report that you have here, John? Yes, indeed. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk you through um, briefly using a, a PowerPoint. The um, biodiversity supplementary planning document we are proposing, uh, this advisory group recommend on to Cabinet for um, essentially approval of the next stage, which is the public consultation that we anticipate for July. So I was going to do a sort of a quick song and dance, a few slides with PowerPoint and then open the floor to questions if that's agreeable, Pippa. Absolutely. Thank you very much. OK, jolly good. I'll, I'll share my screen and uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that the technology does what it says on the tin. OK, can you all see that? I'm hoping you can. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Thank you very much. All right, lovely. Um, so, as I said, just a few slides to explain um, what this SPD is all about. So it's a, it's a new biodiversity supplementary planning document for uh, Greater Cambridge. Um, well, what is a supplementary planning document? For those of you that don't know uh, anything about planning, supplementary planning documents or SPDs as they're known, um, build upon and provide more detailed uh, guidance and advice for those seeking to undertake development schemes. Um, and they, they uh, give advice on whichever particular area of the local plan they're focusing on, in this case, it's biodiversity. They don't form part of the development plan per se, and as such, they cannot introduce or we cannot introduce new policies through this documentation. So they're really just intended to amplify and guide users on the relevant legislation as it relates to whatever particular topic. And as I said, in this case, it's biodiversity. So they're quite important uh, things. And um, I suppose the question is, well, why is a new biodiversity SPD needed for Greater Cambridge? Why, why, have we, why are we here talking about this? Um, our current biodiversity for South Cam's District Council, um, our current SPD for biodiversity is from 2009. And therefore, it reflects policies which were drawn up probably in the years before that, from 2007 um, and, and on, possibly even older in some cases. And so it's really very out of date. Our current policy guidance is just not in step, in line with existing policy. Um, also, we're now a joint planning authority with the City of Cambridge, and the City don't even have an SPD for biodiversity. So it's a, it's a, it's a quick win for them as well. Um, as I've said, policies have changed quite a lot since 2009. And so the guidance really needs updating. Otherwise, we're just sending people off to look at old guidance, which isn't relevant, and that's really not very helpful. Um, currently, our ecology officers, Dan and Guy, really sometimes struggle to signpost developers to all of the recent and relevant guidance. And so um, this document will help them in their jobs. It will help developers to better understand what they need to do and, and why. So that, that's why it's needed. Um, but you might ask yourself, well, you know, here we are in South Cams. We're not in, in Greater London. We're surrounded by fields of green. Why do we need biodiversity guidance? It's already green. You know, what's the problem? Um, well, of course, the problem is, in part, that 70% of what you're seeing, 70% um, of land cover, um, is agricultural land. Agricultural land looks very green. It's lovely as you're driving down the, down the road looking out the window. But monoculture, um, you know, fields of wheat or barley, um, they might look nice, but from a biodiversity perspective, they're deserts. 
Um, and this is what we've done to our countryside since the uh, end of the, the Second World War, essentially. So this is why we need good, up-to-date um, guidance. What does this change? Um, well, it changed a number of things. Obviously, it will make reference to more recent and relevant local and national policies. So it will reference the local plan from 2018 um, for South Camps, but it will also reference um, uh, national legislation such as NPPF, which talks about things like biodiversity net gain. Very important if we're thinking about uh, improving biodiversity. As I've said, it highlights requirements to include measurable, that's the key, measurable biodiversity net gain on new developments and suggests a figure of 10%. Now, the reason it's suggesting 10% is that we anticipate that's what's going to be in the Environment Bill um, scheduled for the autumn. Um, but there is also an aspirational piece in this SPD that says, these councils, this LPA, you know, it's looking to 20%. That's not our policy currently, but we have this aspiration. As you've already said, Pippa, there's the, the, the doubling nature um, uh, uh, document, which was released in February. So it's very much looking to the future, while also at the same time being clear that these are the existing policies and this is the existing guidance on those policies. And it confirms the DEFRA metric. Uh, the reason that's important is that we know that some developers come to the table with sort of um, ad hoc means of measuring biodiversity before they develop. And some of those things, some of those um, uh, metrics can be fudged. Uh, they can, that's not a technical term, but they can, they can fudge the numbers and, and make it look like it's better than it actually is. So we need them to use the DEFRA metric. Um, it explains different district level licensing uh, for great crested newts. It's another introduction. But it explains non-binding biodiversity enhancements such as bat, bird, insect boxes on 50% of dwellings in major developments. So that hopefully the large house builders can sort of get their get their game together with that. And it introduces, uh, importantly, a clear and common process for standardised nomenclature for the respective councils. So this means we'll be speaking the same language, whether we're in the city or within South Cairns. And it's just it's standardising that language for the reports, which I think will be very helpful. Um, the process for developing this SPD, you may or may not remember, I was um, I was here before you on the 12th of January, before we started drafting, proposing uh, this is what we do um, and saying I'll be back in summer. Here we are, hasn't time flown. Um, but essentially, this is the process on the screen. Uh, we start with the justification of need. Always, the, always a, a good idea, project planning, uh, the drafting process, which has been going on since about January, the end of January, then on to the member committees phase, which is where we are now. Um, hopefully, you guys will approve this for public consultation, which is going to uh, take place in uh, July and August. Then on to the amendments, which will come out of that consultation process, and then hopefully member adoption uh, towards the end of, end of this year, for uh, anticipated use by the beginning of 2022. So that's the process and that's the, the rough timeline for the SPD. Um, just a couple more slides here. Uh, so what difference will this make to developers? Well, we'll give them unambiguous, up-to-date, consistent guidance across the LPA, which is obviously a good idea. Uh, certainty that their schemes are being built in line with current regulations and not, not referencing documents which are out of date. That's, no, one's, uh, no one wants that. But it will also give um, developers, whether large or small, the opportunity to demonstrate that their schemes are following best practice. And they can, they can use that as a, a platform, if you like, to shout about their good work. So it's, you know, it's not just um, a stick, it's a carrot too, I would hope. Okay, um, what difference will it make to biodiversity? Well, we can, we can begin to deliver on the doubling nature vision, which was in the strategy, which uh, was, uh, uh, came out in, in February 2021. Uh, we think that through biodiversity net gain, that's really the most robust vehicle we have for delivering that doubling nature vision. Um, obviously, this will hopefully result in inclusion of more habitat for biodiversity across our developments. And of course, importantly, it reaffirms, it reaffirms the importance of biodiversity to both councils. It's another indication, it's another, uh, 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 it's, it's more evidence that you're actually doing what you promised to do uh, to the public and uh, you're, you're setting out your stall. So it's, it's a win-win, I think. And what difference will it make for us? Well, there we go. 
fabulous development. That's uh, Camborne. I'm sure many of you, in fact, you can see the building that you're, you're currently in, just the, I'll say in, the, uh, in the top left-hand corner. And of course, Camborne's a great example of um, a new development. It's not new anymore, it's ongoing. But um, it does have this fabulous balance of a master plan, new community, but with space for nature and space for people. Something so very important, uh, we've all learned over the last year, have we not, um, through COVID, the importance of accessible natural green space for everybody. So it, it will make a massive difference. Um, last slide, timeline for this process, essentially this, uh, the PTS uh, chairs briefing was last week. They didn't want to see it because they had no questions. I think they were, they were happy for it to just progress. Um, this morning, the formal cabinet have seen, have seen this and some of you were there. Um, climate and advisory, uh, the next member meeting will be the end of June for PTSC, which is the city, uh, and then the Cabinet South Cams on the 5th of July. And that, that's all I've got for you. So if you've got any questions for me, I'd be happy to, happy to take them. I'll just stop sharing my screen, and um, if I can remember how to do that, and uh, we'll be on our way. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jordan and Jane and the whole team for, for this. And, um, it, it really, really is important to see this. I think, in fact, in 2018, we talked about updating this, this SPD. So it's fantastic to see it here now on the back of the Dublin Nature Strategy as well. And so I open it up to committee members in terms of any um, comments or questions that they might have on this particular draft or on the process going forward. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, very clear to me, um, this uh, document, as you might expect, is, is mainly focusing on, um, well, not only mitigation, but also, obviously, um, a net gain of biodiversity where we're looking at um, development, which normally would mean housing. Um, but, but given our sort of call for green sites um, uh, as part of the local plan, I wonder how this fits in with that, and I, I wonder how this would um, sort of talk to the kind of application where um, the biodiversity net game is the primary um, objective of a development rather than something that needs to be part of a mitigation. And I'm thinking of, you know, for example, a solar a farm, for example. Um, if, you, if you look at the cost of the panels versus the farmland cost, uh, is approximately um, the panels themselves per unit hectare are five times more expensive than the farmland. So that suggests that actually it's possible to combine an array of PV um, with a very significant sort of um, margin, if you like, around the, the actual array that provides biodiversity uh, as the primary objective. And I just wondered um, how this would sort of play to that um, as, as a, a kind of slightly different situation that's an excellent question because essentially well these things are created with primarily well i say primarily um yeah primarily in, in mind the kind of development that takes biodiversity away from us and that we need to replace and in, in this instance not just replace but go go higher and replace plus so when we have developments which are of the kind that you've described which come forward and in a way, have already offset that need. I think it's a it, it's a valid question to ask. I'm not sure I have a, a, an off pat answer for you, other than um, within the DEFRA metric, which is the method by which we measure the baseline for biodiversity, um, there will be a very clear, unambiguous calculation as to what the biodiversity take is for that site, and through that process, we can arrive at um, a, a transparent. Um, an unambiguous figure which we can use to plug in and say, well, okay, it might look like uh, you've done this. However, the maths, the sums, the process, as, as approved by DEFRA, not the local council thing that we've cooked up, suggests that actually um, there's been a loss of X, Y, Z, and therefore you have to. It might not be the case that that that, uh, that, that we have that kind of loss. So it's a very good question, Councillor Harvey. I'm not sure. Um, I, I'll defer to my boss, Jane. What, what do you think on this one? Well, I don't. I, I think it depends.
depends on the nature of the application. So if we're talking about a solar farm, it will very much depend on what comes forward, what is actually being proposed and what harm there's being caused by that. So, for example, I mean, we talked, um, we've talked previously about North Stove, for example, and the loss of land availability for farmland birds. You know, if in this instance, um, in the case that we're considering now, you know, had we had a lot of loss of land because of the farmland birds, you know, there would still be an impact which would need to be mitigated. So I think it's looking at every case on its merit. Um, so you know, a solar farm would have a lot of um, things in its favour in terms of you know, the, the renewable energy, but actually, you know, we still need to look at the impact it has in terms of biodiversity. And so that might absolutely still be necessary in, in that case. And we would look at that um, as when we got an application. Um, uh, it's very interesting. I, I would have made some, some direct comments to uh, Mr. Cornell, um, but I wanted to know uh, one thing I, I felt, I mean, it's something I generally feel, um, is that uh, there is a bit more of a need for an introduction to the, the setting of our biodiversity, uh, not just landscape, but the, the biodiversity in the area. Um, the, seems to be lost a bit because of our, the way we taught, taught these geography, perhaps, in school, if you go back, uh, that uh, learning about the structure of the land, the geology, the, 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 how we set in the geology of the whole of the region, um, is important in understanding our area and, and uh, also explaining priorities. Uh, I think that would actually help um, in, in this. Um, I mean, the learning about the way that we have the, the, the various sedimentary layers being exposed by Sivitol, the exposure of, from, from uh, east to west across the region, um, and something about the structure helps you understand the context. Also, the adjoining areas, for instance, I, I commented about the, the woodland in the southeast of the county on, on, on the chalk, which is uh, not really mentioned as a, an area, but it is ancient woodland. And, but part of a much larger area, so you can only understand it in thinking in terms of Suffolk and Essex. Um, uh, and I think somehow that needs to be put in as a context, particularly if we, uh, we're not quite sure how agricultural policy is going to go in the future. And it may be that we become more involved in the determination of agricultural grants and the way that agricultural uh, policy is settled. And this would provide a framework for us in doing that. I think that would be helpful. Um, but that's just a thought. And there's no doubt coming the consultation stage. I should perhaps mention, I don't think it's a formal, a, a, a formal interest, but I do know one of the people who works for the agent, uh, the consultancy that works for that many years ago through an organization called uh, at the time the Working Panel of Local Policy Ecology. But uh, uh, just as an acquaintance. <laughs> yes, no. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Khan. Um, I'm, I did receive your comments. Um, you'd, you'd clearly read the document and given some. Um, a good amount of thought to this and I would completely agree that the setting out of the context within which this sits within which our, our landscape sits is incredibly important for just painting the picture correctly um, in, in, a, in a way that um, helps folk to understand um, we have had I would I would say um, in the various drafts as we've gone through the drafting process we have had um, an introduction section which was much broader than it is currently configured and currently written. And the reason that we have um, the, um, a somewhat shorter introduction now and a more focused introduction is that we were made aware primarily by our policy colleagues that this is a policy document and there are um, not limitations, but the envelope within which we can write about all, all the kinds of stuff which are, for instance, in Doubling Nature. Doubling Nature is a really excellent document, but it's not. Um, intended as sort of a, a hard-nosed policy document. And so there was, there was a, somewhat of a steer as to, you know, try and keep it focused and not, not go too, too broad and too wide. And so it's, it's been quite a balancing act to do. And, and possibly there is, um, I mean, obviously out of this process, we're going to get a steer. And if the steer is, we need more context, oh, I'm, I'm very happy to take that forwards. <laughs> um, yes. Good, yes, oh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, this was a, obviously a lot of hard work gone into this document, um, very thorough, and I learned a great deal, so thank you very much. Um, I have a specific question, um, just about targets, really, um, in terms of, uh, it was actually section 
um, 5.5.26, I think, talks about the um, the land managed for nature increased from 8 to 16 percent as the as the target, and that a value of 20 percent is probably likely to be needed in terms of net gain in order to achieve that. But then in 5.5.19, um, it's a it, it says the 20 percent level. Um, it doesn't set this figure as a fixed target, um, and it might be an aspiration and depends on the environment bill. I mean, does that, does that target need to be consistent with what will come in the environment bill, or has the council got the flexibility to be able to set its own target? Gosh, that's a very good question. And th this forms the basis of um, many of the early discussions that I was having with our policy colleagues. Um, the reason being, that environment bill, we think, will contain a clear 10% mandate. Um, therefore, um, remember this is an SPD. We cannot make new policy in an SPD, right? So we, we can't mandate 20% in this SPD because that would be seen as creating new policy. What we can do, of course, is we put 20% in the new local plan as it comes forward over the next two years. And I'd, I'd encourage you to, you know, 20%, uh, um, uh, you know, knock it out of the park. But we really must, um, in terms of the guidance in this SPD, really the best we can do in terms of a mandate is 10%, but we can advise aspirationally that 20% should be best practice or, you know, a, 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 good, a direction worth going in. But it, it's, it's, it's tricky. I had to go to legal actually for the language on that um, because it, it, we can't be seen to be supporting things which just don't exist in policy at the moment. And with all our policy, if I could just add a few things, whenever we're bringing policy forward, there's got to be an evidence base. So at the moment, behind the scenes, a lot of your officers are working on that local plan, getting the various evidence base. So a decision will come before you as members later in the year about the sorts of things you want to put in the local plan, but it will have to have an evidence base behind it. So as John said, we can't do it at this point in time, but we will, you, may, you, know, you may well be able to do it next time with the local plan, which isn't that far off now, members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Beaufort. And, um, yeah, and I'm sure we need the evidence in writing, but I think our the biodiversity opportunity mapping that looked at it and said yep. that, you know, we are one of yep. the poorest areas in the country yep. for, for biodiversity and tree canopy cover and land managed for wildlife um, is part of the evidence, but I know that the yeah. bringing forward even more, more evidence. Yeah. Um, and so I, I would just hope that this is a little bit, that we can be as strong as possible, that's what I would like to see, um, with legal advice, you know, following on what from Councillor Beer Park says there, which is a little bit like when the government said, we will be bringing forward policy that says no gas will no, you know, soon be in housing. Now that's a message to the market and that starts things changing already. Everybody gears up for it and that's why we put in the doubling nature strategy. We aspire to 20% and we, you know, we're letting them know that in the local plan, we aspire to 20%. So everything we say must be gearing them towards that's what we want to do in the local plan and in the local plan, we can set our own target, as I understand, even yes. though the government that's environment right. bill may be 10%. Yep. That's what yes. I understand. Right. Um, yep. The Oxcam mark has put 20% as one of its principles, and we'll be looking to see that being rolled out across the Oxcam mark. So what we're hoping is everything locally will be pushing that, that ambition. But thank you, Councillor Beaupart, for, for bringing that, that forward. And we must make sure, I think, in the forewords and wherever possible, John Connor, just please make sure that we push the language as far as possible so that we're sending the signal that, that they know as the minute we can that we will be there and many of these are about major developments that have multi-year build-out periods so they don't want to start with something and then get caught that the policy yeah. comes in in the middle and they're not actually compliant then so you know with our staggered sustainability um, master plans that say you have to review in light yeah. of policy every couple of years so hopefully that message will be very strong and they would see that as, as rational to be already aiming for that. That would, that would be very, very good. Um, and, and I noticed just, just this morning, I think that's one of the comments that will be going to the, um, the, the, the water treatment relocation would be, you know, if they're speaking 10%, no, it's 20%. If you're going to provide anything, it would need to be 20%. Does anybody have anything else, Councillor Harvey? 
Yes, thank you, Jack. Um, I had a quick look, um, and maybe I missed it, but I know that the, um, a lot of people are worried about um, deliberately degrading the um, baseline biodiversity as a way to avoid actually ending up with um, a higher amount of biodiversity. For example, you know, you, you could take some farmland uh, or, or some woodland, um, chop the trees down, and you say, well, actually, my baseline is now down. And I think it turned out that um, this, this is kind of coped or, or um, foreseen because actually it's, it's from when the Environment Bureau was first presented to Parliament. Um, I didn't yes. notice that was mentioned in the SPD, and I wondered whether that was because I actually don't want to encourage people um, to kind of take that kind of action from a piece of land that it would date from before um, when the, uh, you know, um, I, I, I just wondered if, um, if it should be mentioned. You can certainly put it in. Um, I, th I think that there's a, it, it's always a balancing act, isn't it? You don't want to um, introduce ideas into the, exactly. yeah, yeah. you know, but, but equally, you're absolutely right. It is um, the, the, the baseline, as we're calling it, is benchmarked as uh, that date from when the environment bill was first introduced, which I believe is the beginning of last year. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember the exact month. Um, so there's no way around that. But um, and, and we, we, can certainly, we can certainly put that in there, uh, Councillor Harvey. I, th I think it would be a good addition and it wouldn't take too much space. So um, I'll make a note of that. Sorry, just following on from um, Councillor Harvey's point there, um, in terms of location, so um, uh, and how far away um, the mitigations for uh, biodiversity needs to be for new ap applications that are coming through. We mentioned the, uh, so for example, the water treatment plant or a new housing development. Um, wh when we look at sort of offsetting the, the, the biodiversity somewhere else, is there um, a sort of constraint as to how far away from the application that biodiversity needs to be offset? Or is it acceptable to just to offset that anywhere in sort of South Cam's, um, you know, within the sort of council area? Or, or should, I, I didn't sort of get a feel for sort of how close in proximity it needed to be. Well, well I think what we'd be doing um, within under the auspices of best practice is to cite that offset as close to the area of damage or biodiversity take as possible. That, I mean, that, that's what we'd always seek to do. However, um, with smaller sites, so with smaller developments, we know it's going to be a massive challenge in a way that it possibly isn't for places like Camborne and, and Water Beach. So smaller developments might not be able to offset within the red line boundary. Therefore, we're going to have to look elsewhere. Your question is, do we have a number, I'm guessing, that we can say, well, it has to be within five miles or it has to be within 10 kilometres or whatever. I'm not sure we do. I can certainly look into that. I think it's. I think the, the, the term or the, the working uh, logic is within a reasonable distance. Um, and we can look at North Stowe. As you know, North Stowe allocated um, a, a farm for farmland birds um, to its north northeast. And that was within about, someone's going to correct me on this, but I think it was within about 5K, might, might have been even closer. So we're not looking, you know, if you're developing something in southeast, uh, southeast part of the district, we're not going to plonk something on the, you know, the, the completely opposite edge. That wouldn't be best practice. Um, so, you know, within, within a reasonable distance. But I, I take your point. Should we have a metric? Should we have a number? Jane, I don't know. Is there, is there some precedent for that? I don't think there is. I think it will also depend on you know, what you're trying to mitigate. For example, if it's a particular species, where is the best place for that habitat to go? So, for example, there may not be something suitable within, say, 2K. I think, in all honesty, over time, as we go forward over future years, biodiversity get, net gain gets um, you know, great attraction. There will actually be a whole series of schemes. So we'll be working with partners to actually put in place opportunities. So all this information we talked about in terms of you know, the biodiversity opportunity mapping that's been done as part of the evidence base, that will give us some direction about what can happen where. We'll, you know, through the next local plan, there will be a green um, infrastructure strategy coming in parallel with that. So that will give you opportunity. So I think the thinking about where biodiversity offsetting should happen will um, develop and be sort of galvanised over the next coming next few years in parallel with the local plan as we work with partners and see what can happen where, where the land is, where it's appropriate for the species or where the landscape 
it's right for the, for the species to take place. Thank you very much. That answers my uh, question. I think just sometimes um, residents, um, you know, do have a concern with new developments yeah. and um, uh, bits of infrastructure that they, you know, they won't see the um, biodiversity yeah. net gain in their locality. So, um, yeah. you know, I think they worry about it being put in the easiest or most affordable or Place rather than a yeah. place that's actually close to the proximity where that sort of uh, you know development is taking place. So um, I, I get the reasons for not having maybe an exact um, sort of formula for that, given you know different species and so forth. But I think um, you know it really needs to be clear within that document that the, um, the that the net gain is put very close in proximity to the. Um, the development or infrastructure that is taking place. That, thank you for that answer. Good, thank you. And I think this really is designated, for example, you know, the, some of the A14 biodiversity offsetting that happened was even outside our district, never mind close to where it was happening. Yeah. So this is really about, you're absolutely, it's about making sure that we've got greater control of it. And I think also about the maintenance and management of it. So it's somewhere, you know, where it, it can thrive you know, and therefore can be um, and accessible, I suppose. So can I, um, what was the point before that? What did you, what was your point before that, Jeff, was on the? Base lining. Base lining, Ah, Bill. yes, so I do, I, I think that this, it's a bit like this messaging, isn't it? So I think it would be a little naive to think that most developers don't know all the tricks in the book already. <laughs> and, and the other point is, this is something they may not know. And this is what's right. called a deterrent, at least. So it's in the other way, as we're sort of trying to message and incentivize good behavior, I think letting them know that bad behavior, you know, w won't go anywhere, I think would be important to be in. And I don't, I don't think it would be um, necessarily opening people's eyes to a new trick in the book or anything like that. But I do think probably, I'm not sure that everybody does know about the, the baseline. Probably they do, but I think it's good to have it in the document, as Councillor Harvey says. Um, could I just bring a couple of things? And I'm sorry that I didn't send these before. So um, we don't make a mention of Section 106 in here. And I was just wondering, um, even just as something that's, that's sort of happening you know, locally in an area where the community has come together to, through a neighborhood plan, to identify, designate a place and then purchase that place and make sure it can be accessible um, in perpetuity forever for the community. Um, and it now therefore is something that they've just seen in a section 106 agreement could be supported. So when we're looking at the maintenance and management of these areas, that's the difficult thing, isn't it? When you're looking at it being close, so if this is then becoming a community asset and Section 106 can help maintain that, I don't know whether that would come into something, because it's part of the planning policy, it's part of that, you know, what might be happening around the development, that could also be positive to support our biodiversity enhancement, not through the net gain piece of it, but actually how planning developments can, can support in other ways. I don't know if that could go in there. Absolutely, it could. Yeah. You can do a cross-reference, that's not a problem. Um, and then the other thing would be, you know, and on the agenda today, we've got chalk streams. And I think we did mention this before. Where is the role of water in this, in, in terms of water and development and abstraction and biodiversity? Do, do In the dibbling nature, we had a, a big discussion in strategy about where water came into that, and we decided we would include water within the dibbling nature strategy. So I'm just wondering, here, I know it's difficult, but you know, is there some way of including that? We've got the suds, and the suds does, you know, suds do, and I see in the document that the suds is sort of looking towards that. But in, is there any other way that we could look at that? Where we're, we're looking at reducing abstraction because that's a necessity um, in, in many different ways, or that you can actually contribute to the enhancement of. Um, the groundwater and, and the chalk streams, where they are? It's a very good point, um, 
Councillor Hayling, and of course it is um, something that's foremost in our minds when we think about development and this area. Um, and it's also a very hot topic, isn't it, politically? Um, I, I think, um, and, and again, Jane, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we've been led by existing policy and have shied away from making any, well, I mean, we, we simply can't, you know, create new policies or, um, you know, get, get, give a steer for things which aren't absolutely black and white and in existing local plan policy. So in, in my mind, when I think about the, the water issue, I think about the emerging local plan policies, which of course we can write and, um, and, and make robust. But beyond SUDS, uh, which is in which is in there already, I'm, I'm not too sure how we would make that more robust in, in terms of amplifying the message around the aquifer, for instance, the chalk streams and, and all of the challenges that we have there. I'm, I'm really, it's just, it's that, it's that fine line between, you know, amplifying existing policy or being seen to sort of stretch that envelope. And so I suspect that the reason it's, it doesn't come, it doesn't come through more clearly is because, because of that, that difficult line we've had to tread, but, um, yeah. I don't know. We, I mean, we've actually got guidance in terms of. I'm just trying to think about the biometric, the um, the metrics for biodiversity, and what what water, what part pl water plays in that. Um, I mean, certainly it's a key issue for policy making when you're talking at very strategic level about actually what you know how much growth could an area take, where does the water come from? Because actually we're not in control. The, the local authority, the local planning authority, is not in control for all the abstraction licences. That said, obviously we are absolutely having conversations with. Um, the water bodies and the water to, to have those to have those conversations, but I'm not sure, other than suds, what more we could do or expect any individual, you know, developer or individual householder to do, because actually they're not actually necessarily in control of where their water supply comes from. But and Guy, would you want to add anything at this point? Thanks, Jay. Now I, I think you've covered it. It's um, when we're using the biodiversity metric, it's about um, area mainly for the land-based stuff. But water courses, it's a linear metric that we use. But again, it's very much about the habitats along the banks or riparian habitats or the actual bed, the geomorphology within the river, rather than the water that's coming or not coming. So, yeah, it's not an ideal system for looking at water courses and particularly picking up chalk stream issues. So I think the answer in a nutshell is we will be doing it, but not through this document, Pippa. OK, and so maybe the one one small thing I was wondering, it's a bit like sort of with our back boxes or whatever, and I don't know if this comes in, but it is around design and which is that the issues around guttering and rainwater storage um, into gardens, which, of course, you know, with the increasing heat waves and droughts that we will, you know, are potentially to come, that that would be something that could help um, improve it and just makes that link. And I know yep. it is in our existing part, it's just sort of beefing that up a little bit. I don't know if that's possible. Yes, absolutely. We can amplify that. Yeah. Guy, do you want to say something about water butts? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If you want to add anything about water butts and what we try yeah, to do. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's sustainable, it's pushing the yeah. sustainable urban drainage. And yeah, yeah much exactly. water course, you know, much water can get infiltrating and sort of filtered through the land that ultimately ends up in our chalk streams, then so much better. Suds and butts. Could we have suds and butts? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can try. <laughs> Great. Okay. Councillor Khan. Um, I, I want to reiterate the uh, point that. Um, was making regarding um, the, the, the proximity, the, the, the role of a natural area. Um, I think there is an important, uh, we do have a tool in terms of the need to provide for informal recreation. Uh, and this area, uh, apart from being uh, very intensely, partly because it's a very intensely farmed area, has a relatively low uh, accessibility to large area, uh, areas of informal recreation in the countryside, which hasn't really, I don't think, been but uh, taking into account, except in the very large developments. But in terms of the uh, other developments, it is a, it's difficult to normally take into account. But I think there is a policy basis for it. And that ties in also with biodiversity uh, and access to natural areas and biodiverse areas. So I think it's important to draw the link between those two, because it might give you a tool for, for in terms of planning terms when you're coming up to policies. Um, uh, but if it's, I think there is justification in the existing policy, um, 
Uh, and, but it is important to draw the link, otherwise you may find difficulty when you actually come to uh, dealing with actual applications. That's just a thought. Okay. One more, Councillor Bakersfield, perhaps? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think just coming back to the uh, water use question, I think this is really a question about kind of indirect impacts on biodiversity of new developments. So the water use is obviously one. Um, I mean, just to give another example, um, near where I live in Wall Street, a lot of the fields are growing turf, um, which probably has lower bio biodiversity, reduces the biodiversity compared with even arable fields. And, you know, I think possibly a lot of that turf is going to uh, new developments, to gardens, open spaces, that sort of thing. Um, I just wanted to raise the point, really, that I think, you know, a lot of the biodiversity impacts of new developments can be indirect rather than direct. I'm not sure it's necessarily for the scope of this document, but it was just something I wanted to add. Thank you. Good. And again, um, echo the words that said congratulations for a huge, excellent piece of work in, in this document. So as I understand as the committee, what we would be doing is to, you know, recommending um, that, you know, this goes to the next phase, which would be public consultation. But I understand it goes to, first of all, to city um, and then to cabinet and then it would be public consultation. Yeah. yeah. And then it would come back, we're looking at late 2021, and in this timetable, you had to get it all done in one year, which would just be fantastic, which means that it has some effect before we get to the new local plan, you know. Yes. So we're not just doing a, a supplementary planning document, there'll be one that can actually be implemented. So thank you for driving this forward, and it looks like you're keeping to the timetable so far, so excellent. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Councillor Hawkins has a hand up in the middle. Oh, yeah. Hello, sorry. Councillor Hawkins, sorry. Good afternoon. Hello, <laughs> you look surrounded by biodiversity. Wonderful. <laughs> well, if not, why not? Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I just wanted to uh, note, you know, formally in your meeting, my thanks to. Um, John and to Jane and to the team for putting this document together. Well, obviously, a lot of work has gone into it. Um, and um, look forward to using it once we get to the stage of adopting it. Um, the, there's a couple of things I just wanted to highlight and the fact that one of the themes of our um, evolving local plan is biodiversity and open spaces. And so, of course, we're looking at uh, the future of this document as being able to be used, um, you know, with the new plan once it's adopted. So, in regard to um, the net gain figures that you've, you've discussed before, which is, you know, 10 percent is stated here, but we are aiming for 20 percent. I just wondered if the wording couldn't be tweaked so that even if we stick with 10 percent now, it's not the be end and end all, um, and that this policy can be applied with the new um, local plan whenever that's adopted, even if we're not reviewing this SPD sort of, you know, before then, if you see what time is, so it's applicable <laughs> to the new plan when that gets put in place. Because I, I just remember what's happened with um, mm you know, the minimum spacing for housing, where we granted planning permission at a time when it was, you know, it wasn't specified, and then it came to reserve matters, and the uh, developers were saying, well, you didn't specify that in the conditions when you gave us the permission, so you can't tell us to do that now. You see where I'm going with this? Yes, and it wouldn't be difficult to do, because we could say something along the lines of, uh, uh, the, you know, the mandatory 10% within the Environment Bill, or anything coming forward in new local plans, whichever is higher, or, or, or something on, you know, well, the top of my head. Effect. Yes. Something like that. That wouldn't be difficult to do. It's a great idea, too. And absolutely, we could do that. Please, <laughs> please do. Okay. Um, that'd be great. Thank you. And um, the other thing I wanted mm. to uh, touch on was how we can get local communities engaged with this, especially when they have developments coming in their areas. Um, I don't know, you know, have a think about it. Um, 
just an, an example, another example which I can give, even though within the BNE team, is when um, play spaces are being developed. And I know that the urban design officers actually engage with the primary schools and secondary school students and get them involved in designing the play areas because, you know, it's their generation that's going to use it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I wondered if we could engage with communities in a similar way, either with, you know, a, the group that is doing biodiversity things or the parish or the school, something, a way in which we get the community actually involved. So it's not just a document and this is something for pop, it's something they've had um, engagement with and can relate to and have had an input into, because then they feel like it's theirs. I think we'll take that one away for today. Um, We've got all sorts of ideas. <laughs> we don't want to take to the authors. Um, but obviously things like, you know, you know, through the consultation process, we'll be wanting to highlight this with all sorts of people, not simply, sure. you know, our um, you know, the, the nature our nature partnership, but actually, you know, the community at large, schools, etc., to actually comment on it, to actually help, help to... We talked a little bit this morning about having some sort of launch event as well. And I think the other thing is to making sure we're sharing best practice, which again, you know, there's lots of good things happening on the ground. Your officers are already asking developers for 20 percent. But what we're not very good at is actually celebrating where we've got it and actually showing that. So I think it's a combination of things. So just getting a bit of a plan around this side of things to show what's actually happening on the ground and what we tend to achieve. Um, but actually, as you say, what communities can do, because some, some of this through the planning process, but that's not to stop people doing things for themselves. And a lot of the parishes are really stepping up to, to do that without any, you know, any involvement ourselves. I mean, this team works closely with Siobhan as well. And obviously, we've got the action plan that will be coming from the um, Dublin Nature Strategy as well. So there's quite a lot of crossovers between what the planning service does and other parts of the council, which, again, we're very mindful of and we're very much working together and in partnership. Of course. Thank you, Chair. That's Thank my input. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I completely support um, what obviously our lead cabinet member for planning says on the wording, which sounds fantastic. As long as we don't lose 20 percent, so it's, it's, even yeah. though it's still, <laughs> it's what could come in future <laughs> what could, or, or any higher amount. But let's make sure that the 20 is in there as mentioned as well. But somehow, I'm sure you'll come up with a way of doing that. But thank you very, very much for that, for all this great work. Thank you. Thanks. And we do move on to agenda item nine, which is the Chalk Streams report. And Guy, you're with us. I am. Hi there. Hi, I don't know if Melcher, yes, wants to introduce. Uh, yeah, I'll just quickly have a, uh, say a word. Thank you, Guy, for, for coming. So just to say that, um, that Guy is the Cambridge City Council Biodiversity Officer and is introducing a presentation on the Greater Cambridge Chalk Streams project. And this came up from a cross-boundary water summit held in 2019. Um, and Cambridge City Council and Cambridge Water commissioned the Wildlife Trust and the Wildlife Trout Trust to assess the health of the 17 main chalk streams emerging from the aquifer in South Cambridgeshire. And so this is around the report for that. And the purpose of the item is to start this conversation about what needs to be done, where and by whom, um, and, and where the council comes in. So over to you, Guy, and I will just attempt to share my screen because um, I need to do that for your presentation. Let me just bring that up. Mm. Well, whilst you're right on, we'll, we'll just there start. We yeah, well, excellent. Guy, you will need you... to tell me to push, pull to um, when you want a new slide. Of course, no problem at all. Yeah, thanks again for inviting me. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a biodiversity officer um, and I do give advice um, to the Great Cambridge Shared Planning Service as one of your ecologists, um, but I also manage 12 local nature reserves across the city, um, some of which, such as uh, Nine Wells, actually sit within South Cams. Um, and are the source of chalk streams, like Hobson's Conduit and Vicar's Brook, which we'll talk about. Um, I hope you can all hear me, because my screen has frozen a little bit. Yes, um, can. Yeah, good. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, as Siobhan says, in 2019, um, there was an, an awful lot of concern after a succession of very dry um, 
winters um, of the state of our chalk streams. And it was really highlighted by our communities, the likes of the Cannon Valley Forum, lots of friends groups who are already doing terrific work on these water courses, just what a perilous state they were in. Um, re really, you know, it was, it was that these uh, we've got 200 in the world chalk streams, um, and many of those are, are within England, and um, quite a number, 17, have been identified within our immediate sort of uh, care. So, uh, I'd like to do the next slide, please. Screen is not moving, but I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, OK, so the yeah, next slide should, should read. It's not changing on my screen, but the Chalk Stream um, project we, we've, we've highlighted it's 2019. Um, so uh, on the back of the 2019 summit, um, we realised that there are some awfully big issues, which you'll all be very aware of. They're coming up in the local plan. They're, they're key issues for local plan about uh, water resource, uh, where the water comes from. Um, all of our water coming out of the chalk aquifer is obviously impacting fire obstruction on our chalk water courses, and that has been established. Um, there, since um, 2019, uh, Water Resources Eat has been set up, and that is dealing with this very big sort of hippopotamus in the room, if you like, around uh, where the water is going to come from to restore these water trips to chalk streams. And, um, and there are many activist groups who are saying, without any sort of action, it's not worth doing anything, the chalk streams will die. Um, we very much felt like, yes, we, we need to get on top and embrace water resources east, but there is stuff we can do here and now on these water courses, many of which have been neglected and degraded um, over the years through poor management practices. Um, so we, we went to the best local experts, really, and, and asked the Commissioner report. So that's Rob McGovern, who many of you will know very well um, as your former uh, ecology officer, uh, and absolutely passionate about um, our water courses in South Cairns. He now works with the Wild Trout Trust, um, delivering uh, projects uh, across the, the whole region, actually, but still focused very much in South Cambridge and the city. Um, and uh, he has got so many, he knows intimately these water courses and also the groups uh, that people would work on them and the landowners, as indeed does Ruth uh, Hawksley, the co-author, um, who's the river officer for the local wildlife trust. So together they, they produced a, the baseline report um, in December 2020. Um, which we consulted on um, in March 2021. We had 32 responses from um, uh, the local groups I mentioned, also individuals and, and landowners, um, all very positive, quite quite a mixed bag of, of how they would like to sort of take this forward. Some would like to try and join together, join forces. Others would like to continue to work as they do, but with smaller, sort of easier to access grant funds, that kind of thing. Um, and then we have actually uh, started to action four um, uh, water course projects um, in the city and, well, three in the city and one in South Camps, which I'll go on to talk about. Uh, next slide, please, Siobhan. Well, so Opening that. that. Yeah, yeah. Can you all see a map now? Yeah, just. Sorry, I'm just having difficulty getting it to come up on the right screen, but we'll, there we go. Can everybody see a map now? Yes. Hi, sorry about the technology. Um, so this is a map straight from the report. Um, it identifies the 17 sort of major chalk streams. Now, some of the correspondence we got back during the consultation is, well, what about our chalk stream? Because there are an awful lot of, of water courses emerging from the chalk, um, feeding into these sort of large, larger streams, and, and many are what are known as sort of winterborne. So they're, they're quite really quite ephemeral springs which, which, which arise. All really important, all have got lots of good ecology, but we, um, Ruth, Rob and I did feel we needed to focus you know, our attention on, on the key major assets. Um, so, and also so some people were sort of saying, what about the likes of Bin Brook? That was it's technically not a chalk stream as it rises uh, in the Claylands. Um, it is equally as worthy of our attention. So I, I do not dispute that <laughs> at all. Um, and we, indeed we are looking at that within our own sort of biodiversity strategy in the city. But um, uh, for this particular project, these were the 17 we chose. Uh, next slide, please, Siobhan. So you should now hopefully see um, another extract from the report, um, which shows uh, a more detailed map. Um, so we, we go to section to sections of each watercourse. 
and Robin Reef have done a RAG rating, uh, red, amber, green, uh, on a whole selection of preset criteria about uh, whether it's about poor water quality, geomorphology, um, uh, over widening, um, whether there's community groups already active. So it's to really just start to build up that baseline and you'll see some sort of key imagery on there and sort of target notes. Then next slide, please. There's then quite a detailed commentary um, from one or both um, detailing sort of, again, you know, a narrative of exactly what, what's going on with water courses, constraints, opportunities and sort of challenges. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom of the bullet points there are the real key sort of um, projects which could be taken forward with some broad fit figures put against them. Um, so often they are quite small scale um, and they're, they're things we can sort of crack on with now. We know what needs doing, um, but there's also quite a lot of feasibility studies um, that, that, that are referenced there. Quite often, the feasibility costs more than the actual doing. Um, and that, I think, is quite often what we're seeing. We're coming up against when we're looking to get external grants and things for these projects, um, whereby communities are ready, kind of know what needs doing, but need that um, information, that sort of data behind it to inform any consent and things we need. Um, and then that's the sort of challenge, the sort of catch-22. We've just lost you, Guy. Hi, Siobhan. Um, I, I wonder if Guy can come back in. Um, I can take you through the, the his slides, but uh, let's see. Um, I think it's not much use without Guy. Should, should, would it be worth moving on to the next item and then coming back when we can get Guy back into the meeting? Yes, I think that's a good idea. Is that okay with everybody? We just move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the resources and waste strategy consultations. And we have Bryony with us from Recap Waste Partnership. Manager. Hello. Hello, Bryony. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. No worries. Um, so I've been asked um, by colleagues in the Greater Cambridge Shared Waste Service to come and give a, a brief overview, I believe, of... Um, the resources and waste strategy and what that means for um, waste services in general and obviously what your what your uh, waste collection authority changes might mean um i'm aware that um trevor i work with um in the partnership and um you as a committee may have had some um input because this has been um a strategy that was published in 2018 initially and um the uh, changes that are coming from it are um have been around sort of for quite a while, but we are in the midst of the consultation period at the moment because they were delayed due to COVID. So um, we have, um, I've got some slides I'll put up. Trevor, you'll recognise these because these are your generic uh, slides that I've borrowed. Um, so forgive me if you've seen these previously. Uh, let's put them up. There we go. Can you see those? Cool. Yep, we can see them. You can see those, Fab. Let's do present. Um, so um, the Resources and Waste Strategy came out in 2018, um, and it's um, a strategy that is part, uh, the legislation will be part of the Environment Bill, and it's the biggest changes that are coming um, for waste management service in about the last 20 years, and it's uh, changes that we have been calling for as an industry for a long, long time. Um, and what they're looking to do is um, move us from um, a linear economy to a circular economy. Um, so forgive me if you're all very aware of this, but this is, is just sort of some background to um, what, what I'll be talking about. Um, so this is obviously looking at the resources that we currently um, 
use and making sure that more of those resources are actually reused and um, you know not going into landfill or put into energy from waste until they've actually um, served served their purpose. Um, so um, it's it's a there's some detail on the slides which I can let you have um, and it's obviously looking at um, the amount of carbon that we can save by utilising more of the materials that we actually um, use for things like packaging um, and any of the materials that we actually have in the waste stream that currently are either ending up in landfill or going into an energy from waste facility. Um, the uh, pandemic has obviously affected this timeline quite considerably. But um, when the first uh, strategy came out in um, 2018, this was the aspirational timeline. And DEFRA have been quite firm all the way through um, the pandemic that they actually are not going to be moving from um, any of these times um, of implementation. So we are still working to this program. And at the moment, we are um, at the point of consultation for um, the consistency element of um, some of these changes. So if you look at the um, timetable, uh, in 2020, we were supposed to have had um, a number of things happen, but obviously those have been compressed into 2021 because of, of um, all the changes that have been going on um, nationally. Um, but we're looking now still at a rollout. Um, if you look at 2023, the rollout of um, a deposit return scheme, extended producer responsibility and consistency changes within um uh, the collection for materials in waste in 2023, which is not far away at all. Um, and so even though we are not certain of what those changes are to come because the legislation has yet to be confirmed, we have had uh, two consultations on deposit return team and extended responsibility, extended produce responsibility. And we're in the midst of the consistency one for um, waste. And I'll, I'll explain what those are in a moment. Um, but with the aspirations to include materials that we have in um, uh, business premises as well as in the household that is currently just going into the residual waste and not being captured and recycled. Um, so the definition of what should be collected and recycled is likely to be changing and um, any household type waste that is produced now in business premises will be captured by this, this change in legislation and there'll be a responsibility to ensure that businesses are actually recycling that material um, and um, using reusing more of it than there was previously. Um, and the long term aim is that they wish by 2030 to have 75 percent recycling rate for all packaging. Um, and that's that's quite a leap because um, for any of you that are aware, we currently have um, a, about a 55 percent recycling rate in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough um, in the waste partnership. Um, and that's across the board, taking into account all the recycling that's done at the household recycling centres. Um, and that material is obviously broken down into much more constituent parts at the household recycling centres. They have a very high recycling rate at those centres. Um, the uh, average sort of recycling rate in the partnership at the collection level for household waste is a little lower than that. We're around sort of between 52 and 54, 55 um, percent, depending on um, the types of collections that the district councils have. So you can clearly see there's a lot of work that's still to be done um, to capture more of the material that we're collecting um, and recycle that material. Um, and the long term aim is that obviously what they're trying to do is send a minimum amount of materials um, in the waste stream to landfill um, and to recycle much, much more of it and to create a market for those uh, materials. So the way that they want to, to move the whole um, uh, community to, to shift to this change is that we are looking at a polluter pays principle initially for the the companies and organisations that are producing this material and um, putting it onto the market in the first place. And this is something that many people have been calling for for a long time. Um, what they are doing um, to engage uh, the companies and organisations that produce this is to uh, put the responsibility onto them to pay for the whole life cycle of their packaging. Um, so currently, if you produce something um, packaging wise, a lot of the um, effort and energy goes into uh, the concept to consumer purchasing of packaging. Um, 
they don't give much or any thought to um, the disposal and what happens once it gets into the household. And obviously, historically, what's happened is the waste collection authorities um, have had and waste disposal authorities have had to take that material, regardless of what it is, and find end markets for it, try and recycle it, and if they can't recycle it, dispose of it. Um, so the uh, resources and waste strategy is saying that the producers of this material should um, look at a whole life cycle of that product and they should actually produce something that can be recycled in a local authority recycling um, treatment uh, process um, and, and it's not good enough just to say it's recyclable, it actually has to demonstrate that it can be recycled um, when it's collected from the household. Um, and what will happen is there will be um, a body set up or bodies, we, we're still in the consultation period, so we don't know which uh, route they're going to go down, that will be responsible for um, levying a, a tax on producers of materials that actually don't end up in the recycling and, and aren't able to be recycled. Um, so what it's driving is a, a greater market for um, packaging producers to produce packaging that can be recycled in local authority processes um, and that they are minimising the amount of packaging or the amount of package materials that they use so that they are more streamlined and easier to recycle. Um, they're also looking at um, trying to discourage the use of virgin materials and one of the things that obviously most people are greatly concerned about is the amount of plastics that we use and what ends up um, happening to those plastics and uh, so they are or have proposed and have introduced a 30% uh, tax on virgin plastics to encourage those that use plastics um, for packaging, minimise the amount that is actually used in, as virgin packaging. So um, these changes have been um, talked about and coming for a while, and many of you may notice that some of the big producers of um, consumer products are already embracing these changes and making um, changes to their packaging in the light of this. Um, so we're starting to see greater amounts of recycled plastics in things like bottles um, of uh, fizzy drinks and um, reduction of plastic in things like Easter eggs and, and those kind of common products. Um, and the overall um, you know, requirement for uh, the polluter pays principle is that the producers of this material will actually cut down on the amount of material they're producing and what they do produce will be recyclable rather than um, just going straight into landfill. And if it isn't, they will pay a levy on that material so that they can pay for the cost of disposal and treatment of that material or disposal. Um, the next element is um, looking at how um, we as, as consumers of these products, um, the the amount of material that we bring into our home. Uh, many of you have been shopping and emptied your shopping bags and put things away and found that they've been left with lots of empty boxes and plastic packaging and film and those kind of materials. So one of the things that they're also doing with this strategy is trying to move towards um, incentivising consumers to reduce the amount of what they purchase that has you know, packaging that can't be recycled, thinking about what they are consuming um, and whether it's really necessary because... Um, consumers have over the years been known to, to consume more than they actually need um, and are throwing a lot of materials away that um, you know they shouldn't have purchased in the first place. They're looking at the barriers that have been caused uh, to prevent people from reducing the amount of waste that they have. So looking at um, uh, you know making people aware of what, what, what is good packaging and bad packaging, making people aware of what is actually recyclable and what isn't recyclable. Um, so that consumers can make really good choices about what they're actually purchasing at the supermarkets when they're uh, they're making their um, weekly shop or whatever it might be. So they're looking at empowering people to understand and purchase wisely um, and to think about whether they can reuse uh, materials and limit the amount of plastics they're bringing to the home. And then they're looking at recovery of more of the materials once it actually has been put into the waste stream. So um, looking at increasing our recycling rates across the country, because although we do very well in Cambridgeshire, um, we have very well engaged residents who um, do support the services that the district councils um, have at the curbside. 
it's not the same picture across the country and some local authorities do actually have um, fairly low recycling rates even though um, we've been collecting recycled material at curbsides for a long time. Um, so they're looking at how um, educating the public about the impact of the um, waste that goes into landfill has and looking at obviously the materials that are in that waste that goes to landfill and the hazard that that can create in terms of the environmental impact of greenhouse gases and, and carbon emissions. And so um, there's there's a, an onus on um, us to look at the types of services that we roll out and understand the environmental impacts of those more so than we have in the past. Um, in the past, a lot of waste management has been driven by cost um, and has been driven by necessity to dispose of that material in the quickest, efficient, most efficient way. Um, with less regard to um, the carbon impact and the environmental damage that that disposal option may have. Um, over the years, we have had levies put on um, waste disposal authorities for um, disposal into landfill. We've got better at capturing the emissions off of landfill and using less of it and having alternative disposal routes such as the MBT that we have in Cambridgeshire and also energy from waste that are used in Peterborough. Um, so they're looking at how we dispose of these materials and uh, providing a driver to enable us to make choices that aren't just based on cost for local authorities, but also being aware that actually we could take the, the less waste that we are hopefully going to have after the implications of, of extended producer responsibility and making wise choices about um, the technologies that we use to dispose of those materials and getting as much energy from those materials if we do choose to burn them rather than um, putting them in the ground and then just sitting there and, and um, being uh, put into landfill. Um, there's a big element in the resources and waste strategy that also looks at waste crime um, and hopefully empowering local authorities more to look at um, how we can capture um, those that are committing waste crime and also looking at the data and making sure that we're actually capturing the information about what is happening um, out there. It's, it's not always easy to understand what materials are being fly tipped um, because different authorities capture data in different ways, different people determine what is fly tipping in different ways. Um, as Recap Partnership, we have been trying to tackle this over the last few years with the Scrap It, Scrap it campaign. Um, working together with the Environment Agency, the um, National Farmers Union and the, the Countryside Landowners Association, as well as trying to engage with the police and all the enforcement teams within waste um, collection authorities to look at how they capture data and what actually counts as, as um, fly tipping. Um, and there's, there's greater penalties coming for those that actually commit waste crime um, and looking at the, the fines that magistrate courts put out um, and the... Um, the powers that people have for tackling um, these issues because they're ongoing. Within Cambridge and Peterborough, we spend about half a million pounds a year picking up fly tipping that has been illegally dumped by either organised fly tippers or by um, members of the public who should know better um, and don't take it to the correct places. So this, this is something in the strategy that's also being tackled. Um, and then one of the big changes that's coming, which in um, South Cambridgeshire and uh, uh, Cambridge City, you're already um, sort of further down the path than most of, of trying to address, which is um, collecting food waste from the residential properties um, that produce it. Um, and this is something that needs to be done on a weekly basis because obviously the vermin issues and um, concerns about flies and um, other pest issues that come from having uh, food waste sat around at home. Um, so the uh, proposals is that um, local authorities introduce or is mandated to introduce a weekly food collection at the curbside. Um, and what this would do um, in Cambridgeshire is take out about 30% of the residual waste that is in um, the black bag at the moment. Um, we I have got some authorities that currently capture food waste at the curbside. And as I say, you're rolling out some um, trial uh, um, a trial project um, in, in South, Cam South Cambridgeshire and City to see how um, the residents take to the, the um, service. Um, and there's a, a lot of sort of behavioural change issues around rolling out these kinds of service. But the strategy recognises the savings that can be made um, by 
actually engaging the resident in seeing how much food waste they are producing in the home and understanding where that food waste is coming from. Um, and hopefully by, by them separate, separating it from their residual waste and seeing it as a whole, they'll recognise what, what um, food they're wasting and, and make them think wisely about the sort of shopping they're doing um, in future. Um, and then there's some other elements which these are sort of less relevant to, to yourselves, but just so that you're aware, these are part of the strategy that were included about us being global leaders as a country and it, um, you know, is, is pushing the um, messaging about uh, all of us needing to tackle this problem because obviously waste that is collected in this country has turned up in other parts of the world, having gone through a very long logistical chain of um, brokers and reprocessors and um, organisations that deal with waste without much um, traceability of that waste. And one of the things that the strategy is aiming to do is to find uh, technological solutions to tracing waste so that we can actually be clearer about where it's been collected and where it's been disposed of and preventing the leakage from um, waste management logistics so that it doesn't end up in the sea. Um, or in the environment in the wrong place and causing the environmental damage that we're aware it can it can cause. Um, and they're also proposing to do a lot more research into um, innovative solutions. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, for uh, understanding what's in the, the waste stream um, and understanding if some of these greener packaging materials are actually better um, so things like biodegradable plastics, does that get rid of the problem of plastics or does it just create a new problem? Um, does it, you know, can we can we use digital technology to trace our waste that comes into the home and understand what that waste is produced from and, and how much we're actually capturing of that and recycling it? Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, emphasis in the new strategy about um, the research and innovation that we could um, be adopting for waste management. Um, and then the last point was looking at measuring and monitoring and evaluating that data um, and finding some clever solutions to uh, some of the challenges. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen um, just to come back to you for a moment. Um, so the, um, yeah, the extended producer responsibility, deposit return scheme and, and consistency element of the resources and waste strategy we're right in the thick of understanding the direction that the industry and um, various lobbying groups are taking us in. We have responded as a, a partnership on deposit return scheme and extended producer responsibility by the 4th of June. Those two consultations were very geared towards the conglomerates that produce the packaging. Um, so the big Unilevers and um, Procter and Gambles of this world that have lobbied very hard for um, watering down some of these changes to, to um, minimise the impact that they have on their business. Um, we as local authorities are obviously very keen on them, making sure that the costs are passed through to the relevant bodies that produce this packaging have gone back and said, we're very supportive of these changes. We are aware that it's quite tight in terms of the timescales that they're proposing. And what they are trying to do is make lots of changes all at once. And we as, as um, local authorities think that maybe they should make the change to extended producer responsibility, find out what the impact is, understand how that cost flows down through into paying for um, the disposal of this packaging before they then introduce a deposit return scheme, which is very much um, being pushed by some of the... Um, Lobbying groups that are keen to see um, less litter in the sea, so city to sea, uh, surfers against sewage, those um, those lobbying groups have been very very influential in, in um, impacting on DEFRA's consultation on deposit return scheme. They are keen to see an improvement in litter in local authority in uh, uh, local environments, and, and obviously some of the materials that they're proposing a deposit return scheme on will be things like cans and bottles that we often see, um, you know, dropped in the litter that could be recycled quite easily. So by putting a deposit on them, they're hoping it would incentivise behavioural change to prevent that. Um, we, as a partnership and each local authority, waste managers are not against the principle, but it, it appears to be a very expensive solution for that problem 
when actually you could recycle those materials in your home um, with your curbside collection or have better on-street collection and better business collection of those materials. So you wouldn't necessarily need to have um, uh, those materials um, collected in that way. So, so um, I think the, uh, the, the new one, the consistency um, consultation is um, going to be responded to soon. And that's obviously looking at um, partnership working of making sure that we have policy alignment on our on our collections and that we are collecting the same materials in the same way and, and that the contracts align. Um, so that's a, a sort of overview. Um, and, and I'm happy to answer questions along with Trevor, I suspect, because he's got as much experience, if not more, of this than myself. That was fantastic. Very, very thorough. Thank you, Brownie. That was good. Um, yes, do you have any questions? I, I do have one, which is, so I think this has been the year of consultations or the two years of consultations. And, and mm. it's a bit hard to know when actually something is finally adopted or not. And do you think that, you know, which of these bits, will they all come in one strategy or do you think some of these will happen? And then the second part of that question is, and how much in the, you know, the shared waste partnership are we looking at being early adopters? You, know, you made some mention there of some of them. So just which ones of those would we, we be looking at? I'll answer your first question and I'll pass over to Trevor for the second because obviously as manager of the service, he's got a better idea about the aspirational side. But um, in terms of um, how much it, we've seen watering down from the original strategy to the consultation, so from the first consultation to the second, there was a great um, desire to mandate consistency and that was interpreted by the industry as same color bins same kind of materials same you know a service at the curbside for everybody but there's obviously been some um, uh, awareness that that would cost and that there would actually be environmental damage done by replacing bins to make them all the same colors so the 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 um, change and the the lobbying that's happened through those consultations has unfortunately tempered some of those great aspirations about getting clarity for the public and clarity on the materials because we've all been to places where one side of the street you can do one thing and another side of the street you can't um so i, I would say that um we are seeing a and, and, and even in the most recent consultations i would say there's been a, a drop off of aspiration unfortunately possibly because of the implications of the costs so we thought they were going to mandate um, free garden and we would be flexible enough to be able to have three weekly collections. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to do that. There isn't a mandating of curbside sort, so we are able to do some mingling of some materials to get um, the quality improvements, but without the, the sort of numerous boxes that you may get with a curbside sort solution. Um, so how much I, I think we definitely will get food waste um so i think everybody will be seeing food waste collection coming very soon i think we will see some money in local authorities from extended producer responsibility but how much and how clever the big companies are about avoiding that levy is it only time will tell i don't know what they're going to do about the deposit return scheme because that is something that has been legislated for in Scotland and obviously with the border issues of having something in one part of the UK and not in another you've got potential fraud and cost implications on bordering locations so I really don't know what they're going to do about that so that will be a wait and see but we as an industry were very much pushing that let's wait and see what extended producer responsibility does and um, so in terms of aspiration for the partnership we aspire to do things in the same way but the timings may be slightly different. I don't know, Trevor, if you want to touch on your aspirations locally and what you've done in response to the consultations. Yeah, so as we saw, weekly food waste collections was in the primary legislation rather than secondary. We've already started a trial and we're looking to expand that out. So adding at least another um, three or 4,000 properties to the trial later this year to um, just to test to see how food waste, um, how how much food waste there is out there. Um, 
And whether it's success or failure, it's very hard to measure. The trial we've already been running, the amount of food waste we're getting is extremely high. So um, in one way, that's quite a failure because it means our residents are wasting food, but at least now we can identify that food and hopefully we can work with them to reduce it at source. Um, so we will be looking to expand that, that trial out. So I think the shared service will be looking and hoping to be early adopters. So we are looking and we've done quite a lot of modelling both as a service as well as a partnership about the different potential options. Um, and I think it, it is still quite early days. The difference is we've lost a year from consultation through to implementation. So the implementation date hasn't changed. Um, it has just shortened the, the sort of the, the, the date um, that we'll have time to change services. So I, I believe that consultation, once the consultation is in it, the, after the end of um, uh, or beginning of July, the whole process will move quite quickly. And we will have to then look at what service we provide. Um, whilst, and I suppose I might have my slightly more rose tinted glasses on, while some elements I think they um, move back on, I still think the main objective is about high quality recycling, high quality, um, high amount of recycling. Um, and I think that will come through. So whether we go to a curbside source or a, um, a reduced um, number of materials co-mingled, I think that is the route that's, that's coming um, to ensure that we get quality material that can be then sold and actually be processed in the UK. So we are very much trying to lead the forefront of that process. So as a, as a council, we will be responding to the um, to the consultation both within the waste partnership, but also within the service partnership, but in sort of what we expect and using the experience we've already got. So that will come in and that will be submitted um, sort of with sign offers from the head of service and, and as well as the um, lead member. So we can actually get that submission in. The problem is due to the tight timelines, and again, they've reduced the amount of time of consultation, it doesn't allow time to bring that back through a committee process. However, most of the questions are quite, um, a lot of the questions are quite straightforward about the right way following, as a, as a council, we have clear policy about what we're looking to do for the environment um, and our waste strategy, so we can actually use those to answer the questions. And can I ask a, just a follow-up question on that one? In terms of the, the food waste, and it's talking about 30% residual waste is the food waste, you're saying it's going to landfill, but you're saying through the, the black bin, isn't it sort of, is it a mixture of black bin and green bin? And I'd understood the thing about separating out the garden waste from the food waste so that the garden waste could yeah. be composted or something. So at the moment, we've done, or well, last year, the year before last, we did uh, waste composition analysis. So we basically took our all our bins and um, people went through those in huge amounts of detail, separating into multiple different types and material. And in our black bin, our residual bin, about 33% of that bin was food waste. Wow. That's just in the black bin. So, um, and the target is trying to reduce that as much as possible. Half of that amount um, is avoidable food waste. So it is items that may have been bought, um, but never even unpackaged. So um, vegetables, salads that haven't actually been prepared for use. They have just been bought, um, put in the fridge, not used, put in the bin. So that's pure waste, um, both waste of resources, but actually waste of money. So and that's half our food waste is um, that. So that's about education trying to get people to see it. The other half will come from carcasses and preparation. So you will always have some food waste um, in there because actually moving on to peelings, etc. unless you move that into home composting. But we know that's not an option for everybody. And even people who are very good at it sometimes struggle. But by having separate food waste collections, people will then, um, you normally ask people, do they waste food? The response is normally no, we don't waste anything. When you can see it in a separate food waste collection, you will really quickly see that um, how much you are wasting, whether that's those you bought six carrots and you needed four, all of those kind of things really highlight about what we can do. So that's why it's really important as a as a minimization 
pool to do separate food waste collections. Good. And my, my other question is, in terms of what we're looking at in the our sort of climate environment action plan, or even in the business plan, are we do we have some metrics around that now that you've got that waste composition? Um, you've done that analysis in terms of what we're looking at as a, as an overall shared waste. But, you know, as a so the waste composition analysis. Well, we haven't. We have put some measures in about trying to reduce food waste. Um, we are repeating the um, waste composition analysis again um, later this year um, because it's seeing a trend. What has um, uh, caused issues is actually the world's changed since um, 2019. Um, so actually more people are working from home, uh, more people are eating at home, um, where beforehand most people would eat, eat out once or twice a week. Um, or even more when you talked about lunches, um, and that's really changed. So what we're looking to see is how that will affect. So we have seen our recycling go up, and we've also seen our um, we've seen our waste go up, and we just need to see how that normalises over the next um, sort of few months. And hopefully by the time we do the waste composition analysis in in the um, autumn, we'll be have a clearer idea about what normal is again. Um, and we're also doing waste composition analysis in the locations, both where we've got the food waste trial on and we where we haven't got the food waste trial to see really to see how much food waste we have pulled out of the bin. What we hope is that some of that food waste are, would have gone into the uh, in our food waste scheme. But actually, what we hope is people are thinking about what they're buying and what they're producing and they actually reduce and minimize their food waste in, in its totality. So that, that is success. High tonnage of separate food waste is, in reality, um, long-term failure um, because what we want is that material not to be there at all. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much um, for that. And we do hope that those um, that they finally do implement some of these <laughs> measures and that they are... As, well, the first strategy was fantastic, really, wasn't it? So, I, I mean, I do hope that we can, that they do get around to implementing those. But it's very good to know that we're being early adopters, and I can understand the complexity in that analysis, given the change in, in context as well, Trevor. But it would be good to, to sort of, perhaps from the next year onwards, understand what those targets are, you know, as, as people in the council as well. That would be good. I think there are no more questions on that. Thank you so much. It's really, really enlightening. And um, thank you for the consultation response as well, Trevor, there. That's good. It's four o'clock, members. We've got the um, item on the chalk screens to, to come back. Are we OK to continue? Yeah, thank you. Is that right, Mark, Councillor Khan? Hello? I use this one. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. So we have, um, go back to item number nine. Is that all right, Siobhan? Yes, can I just check with Guy? I think you may be able to share your screen after all, but I'm happy to share mine in, if, if that's preferred. So just let me know. Hi, Siobhan. Uh, sorry, sorry, everyone, for that. Um, I've got no icon coming up that I can share, I'm afraid. I'll okay. keep my paper off, though, just in, in case it problems again. I think you should be able to see that now. Is that correct? I can, thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry again. Um, so we were just going through through the report, um, and as I say e each particular chalk stream, the 17 chalk streams, has been uh, had a baseline assessment. So that involved walkover surveys, uh, the the knowledge of Rob and Ruth working on those water courses, and also the the landowners and communities that they they already work with. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a sort of um, break, breakdown of, of each water course and its key sort of issues and a, a price tag alongside. And um, I don't know, don't know when I was cut off before, but I was making the point that a lot of the, the interventions that we'll go on to talk about are uh, relatively low cost um, and can often be done with volunteers and it's good fun to do so. Um, some of the uh, more expensive things that have been identified are actually sort of feasibility studies and things that we, such as removal of weirs and dams that, we, that might require something like a, a flood audit, things like that. 
And they're the things that we've found historically um, and have also been reported back by groups through consultation are the harder things to actually get funding for. So I don't know if that's something to, you might want to sort of uh, trigger conversations and discussions, but uh, yeah, the sort of community groups in the river, putting gra gravel in the river, relatively easy to fund. Some of the, the sort of preliminary work to do that a little bit harder. Next slide, please. Um, I uh, say so what we actually do to the water courses, um, let's see, notwithstanding the lack of water, what we think that we can do to actually make them far more resilient to low flows uh, and improve the habitat for the biodiversity, which often is clinging on. And I say with the, um, the rains we've had over this current winter, walking along many of our water courses now are an absolute joy and things have really bounced back. And I, I'm, as an ecologist, I'm amazed at how quickly things bounce back, how things are still, still there. Uh, to, to, to come back. So these are uh, the four key things we're looking to do. So there's tree hinging and creation of brass ledges. This recognises that the majority of watercourses have been, uh, if you like, overmanaged. And um, through uh, flood control um, management, we have looked to, to strip out anything that falls into the watercourse. Now, whenever a tree falls over and leans into a watercourse, that's actually triggering um, uh, erosions of one bank, release of gravels back into the channel, which is great for fish to, to spawn in. Uh, it's trapping uh, areas of silt, which marginal vegetation can come into, and that's what the water bowls like to eat. So by keep on removing everything from our watercourses, we're actually removing those natural processes. So these are very simple things. We can literally clear a bank of some of the um, overgrown, overshading trees, shrubs and things, and put them in the watercourse, stake them down, and it's amazing how that kicks, kick starts the processes. Um, gravel placement, this is actually import, importation of gravels. So not something that we do lightly, because it's obviously got a CO2 implication of move, moving the stone around. But again, over management in the past has, has often over deepened and over widened uh, our chalk streams. So the flows they get, particularly in times of low flow, um, uh, is not sufficient to, to clear the bed of gravels of the silt if the gravels are still there, but often they've been dug out and are now dumped on the bank and overgrown vegetation. So by putting the gravels back, these become well oxygenated, um, flowing gravels for fish to spawn and all, all the invertebrates that the fish eat are in, in there, and that's the baseline of, of our ecosystem. So gravel placement is, is fantastic thing, and it also is great to do with communities. I've got some photos on that in a minute. Um, bank reprofiling. Um, so again, it, this is that sort of over-engineering. A lot of our water courses have been straightened, um, uh, over-deepened. So just by grading back the banks, we can get more marginal vegetation, allowing at times of higher flows for it to spill out into their tiny little chalk stream floodplains and just create a far more diverse um, water course and riparian habitats. And uh, favorably named dig and dump. <laughs> that is literally um, taking... So where you might have a water course which has got a very sort of even bed, perhaps not much in the way of gradient, um, using small plant, you can actually start, or sometimes by hand, you can dig areas out, it's fine gravels deeper down and pile them up to make a riffle. So where the water flows over um, quite a shallow area of gravels to oxygenate them and then forms a pool. And that pool is, becomes where you've dug material out from. That becomes a refuge for fish, particularly larger fish, when it, when it gets to low flow. So again, it's quite simple stuff to do on, on site, which has really dramatic effects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so on the, on the back of what was uh, identified, these are currently the, the projects that have been worked on in 2021. So Cherry Hinton Brook, where we've done um, some clearance, has been become very overgrown, very shaded uh, section of Cherry Hinton Brook. And that means there's nothing in the way of marginal vegetation. So it becomes quite a wide channel, fairly devoid of, of um, biodiversity. So just literally just by letting in a little bit of light, uh, which we did in March before the bird nesting season, um, uh, we actually have got an awful lot of silt there. So our, using our uh, revenue drainage resource, we were able to do some desilting work, and that allowed us to get a firm bed to introduce gravels with uh, our volunteers. So that's been really great. And we actually did invert surveys before um, uh, to get a baseline to see What's, how the invertebrates are going to change and how quickly, because um, this section had invertebrates which were very much based on, on the silt um, bed, see how quickly those sort of scarcer invertebrates that need the, uh, the, the oxygenated gravels can move upstream. Um, Vickersbrook, um, that's work that's just been undertaken uh, by Rob and his team and my colleague Victoria Smith, our local nature reserve officer. This flows through Sheep's Green in the city. 
um, rises at nine wells, as I mentioned earlier, fed, fed from Hobson's conduit. Um, fantastic little um, strip of wood course, a path alongside it. Um, we did um, fish surveys here, in, again, baseline to, to see, uh, make sure that what we're doing is making a difference. And we were amazed to find this is an electrofishing survey. So we put a small charge of current in the water. Um, fish of all sizes get affected by that. They sort of float up. We can net them, uh, measure them, um, identify them, do various um, uh, surveys on them and uh, to, to work out what's there. And what's particularly important is the sort of age classes to see if fish are breeding. Um, and here we had 10 species of fish, although I'd, uh, apart from a stickleback, I don't think I'd ever seen a fish in there. So this is pre-works, pre, pre but the species are hanging on in these watercourses. Fairly low numbers, but quite diverse. And the real win was um, we still had brown, brown trout, even breeding brown trout. And that's exactly what this, uh, uh, the work we were, we were focusing on was going to do, which is introduce more gravel with the, with the dump, as I mentioned, the, the woody debris. Um, I've got some images to come. Um, Colders Brook, um, a very simple one. Um, again, this was in our, one of our adoptive watercourses. We had a huge concrete pad, um, which everyone should scratch their heads about, but we think it was a redundant um, cattle drinking platform. Um, but yeah, just smack back in the middle of the watercourse. And then until you sort of walk them and, and really get a feel for every part of it, you don't know about these things. So the City Council will, could very quickly remove that, which we have. And we've actually then put in a bid to create a, a wetland feature here in partnership with the Wildlife Trust in Cambridge Past, Present and Future through a, um, a green recovery fund bid, which we'll hopefully find out about this month. Um, Rob's been working in South Cairns, Rob's been working uh, as ever with the Mel Brook, brook and, and the group there. And uh, they have actually refound a large section of this brook. I think it's something like 40 metres have become quickly, completely entrenched in, in bramble. And the landowners barely knew it was there. And uh, they've, they've un uncovered that. And um, again, with volunteers, been able to put in um, hazel faggots, narrow the channel, speed up the flow, and then introduce gravels. Uh, next slide, please, Ron. So here's just some shots just to sort of demonstrate that. This is at Ch Cherry Hinton Brook. Um, you see where the chap on, is on the bank there, tipping in gravels, all great fun. Um, and you sort of see there's a lot of sky there. Previously, this was all very, very overgrown. So we did have uh, to do quite a lot of, of work. So we explain that to the community um, that you know, sometimes we do need to clear scrub and brush to actually get light to these watercourses to make them thrive. Next shot, please. Uh, here's some of the gravel arriving. This is quite a careful blend of gravels uh, devised by uh, Rob McGovern. Uh, so it's got, uh, it's not too sort of orange in colour. It's got the sort of more natural sort of chalky material in there as well and a really good uh, mix of, of sizes. So it really locks together and performs quite a natural um, hard wearing bed. Next shot, please. Uh, and here we are at Vickers. Um, uh, I haven't put the shot in of Rob, but that's his hand holding that small brown trout. And he was very, very pleased about that, I can tell you. And it is amazing to see these fish breeding right in the heart of the city. Uh, we've got, also got them in the rush, uh, one of the, our bypass channels located on Sheep's Green. So it just goes to show that things are there and we can improve them as these shots are sort of showing here. Um, volunteers putting in the, the hazel faggots there. And what they're essentially doing is narrowing that channel. It's been overwidened by um, drainage operations, but also by stock cattle coming in and sort of poaching the edges. So by pulling that, those banks in, you'll see we start to speed up that flow and hopefully and then it becomes self-cleansing those gravels. Next shot, please. Uh, si yeah, sim similar sort of story there. You can see where we've, uh, on the right where they've um, almost half the width of the channel there um, and created a, a hazel has a bank and then sort of uh, an area which will become mud it's mud at the moment but that will become riparian vegetation so reed rush that kind of stuff which will be great for water bowls whereas the watercourse itself is now much shallower and flowing um, over gravels oxygenating those gravels for fish next slide please uh, and here, here we are in the mail and I say this, this uh, I've not visited myself but this section um, on the right here, you can now see the volunteers in there. This was completely lost. Um, uh, so people barely knew it was there. It was obviously still flowing under there, but now we've got the light in, we've got brushwood um, shelf there that will vegetate up, narrower, speeded up watercourse. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that recovers. Next shot, please. So it's a bit of a whistle stop uh, tour through that, but uh, I know time's pressing and uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, that was just like a nature program, so thank you very much. I was absolutely enthralled with that, and what a wonderful presentation you have there, um, Guy. That was really, really lovely. Thank you so much, and very informative as well. I didn't know quite a bit about um, what you were just explaining there. Any any questions from anybody? It's just a little, you may not be able to answer this, um, but it's, uh, it's actually in the South Cambridge area. The the great concern, obviously, about the supply and the, the effect of pumping on, on the water, uh, on the water resource uh, supplying the, the water. Um, you you commented about the stream coming from the north over the clay, um, which uh, say, but even though it's a chalk stream, well, there is actually quite a large outlier of chalk over Bar Bassenborn uh, uh, and the uh, Barrington, sorry, in the area north of there for Orwell. Are there any chalk streams arising of that? Because that isn't pumped. It's probably, it would have a more reliable, uh, um, what is it, water table uh, because of that uh, and might be quite a useful uh, resource. I don't, I don't know the area well enough, but I just wondered whether there were uh, chalk streams arising from that area north of this, uh, the valley, uh, the, the river, rather than south. I think there, there may well be, Councillor Carl, I say it's, uh, I, I did bow to, to, to Rob and Ruth's Ru sort of knowledge of your area um, on this, and they're very aware, and they say to themselves, this is, you know, this is a start, and there are lots of other water courses um, which we could look to, but um, in order to sort of focus our minds and, and attention, these are the ones we, we, we have gone for. But I'm sure there are, and as I say, through the consultation, we have got a list of, of other similar water courses for consideration. So. Um, and and it, it, it's by no means that setting stone this baseline report. We, we want to add to it. We, you know, we've, it's the questions we're asking of the communities. This is what we know now, but you'll know much more. Please keep feeding in and let, let's, let's grow the project. Good. And in terms of the ones that are specifically that within these first 17 that you've got, and it would be good, that, as you said, other communities could start to say these are other ones that we go on to the next stage. But within those, you were saying about mainly the, the two um, that were in South Cams. And the project list that you had there, so you've shown the actions in those, but are any of those that have got these sort of barriers in terms of feasibility studies that need funding? There are, yes, there, there are in the city. And, and I say, and there's an awful lot of interest um, for, and, so, and, and organisations involved, so the Environment Agency, Cam Valley Forum. So there's a lot going on in this area. So some of these projects are being looked at right now. Um, this was trying to, this project very much trying to get a bit of clarity and focus on what's going on and, and be a bit more coordinated. But um, I think for, for South Cams and, and, and speaking to, to Rob, you know, and, and Ruth, it's, it's very much about um, freeing up the experts' time to be able to get in the water course with <laughs> and, and doing the work and not sort of so much chasing chasing the funding. So um, I, I'm, I'm sort of for my part in the city, I'm very much trying to be the person who can bring a project to, to fruition and then and be able to source that funding for them and say, here you are, you know, go. So all of their time is spent delivering rather than that sort of chasing the money and reporting back. So if there's any sort of help South CAMS can give um, through community grants and various things, then, then I think so, so much the better. Um, Rob also asked me to sort of pass on about um, uh, that South CAMS do, do manage an awful lot of uh, water courses. Um, and uh, some of which are chalk streams. And uh, he talks about the sort of uh, mel as it discharges into the re. And um, he, he's, he, he's identified with, within the, uh, the baseline audit, but some of the management that's undertook there is probably over and above what is required. It's sort of historic practice and could be reviewed. And in doing so, would probably have a, a really big impact um, for, uh, for, for that particular water course. So how are you there, Trevor? You just come across it. Which part of our of the council manages those those areas then? I think you're on mute, sorry. Sorry, struggling to get off mute. Um so yeah, so that will be um that's managed by my team, so that's managed by Lee Hillam, who's just taken that team over. So what I would suggest is um the the Officers just meet and discuss that. So, Guy, it might be worth catching up with Lee just to talk about that. He's only recently taken that that team over, but we have strengthened that team, and we are looking about the 275 kilometres of um, waterways of water waterways that we.
we actually manage. But it may be that some of this work could be um, works that we could do with you as well. So even if it's not on awarded watercourse work. Um, so I think there is options there. So I would just suggest that you have a have a chat with Lee and, and uh, see what could be done. Um, even if that's about bringing in either light or heavy machinery into getting materials at the right place at the right time. But actually, we have a team of four staff as well working on that now. So that it may be manpower or it may be resources um, and it may be budget. Um, what we can do within our sort of day-to-day -day stuff rather than necessarily that we have to put in for grants um, or even requests that we put in as a budget bid for next year to actually put that through. So if you have that conversation with um, Lee or um, Mike Parsons, who's the sort of the manager there, um, I'm sure there's things we could do. And that might be that we just do things differently, um, either less of, more of, or just differently. So that, that should be something we can definitely help with. That sounds very encouraging. Thank you, Trevor. Great. I don't know if there's anything else, but I think that's absolutely fantastic. So we would say that, you know, have that conversation with, with Lee and, and Mike. So one, as you say, from now and potentially do things differently, that could be a budget and from out of that, um, you know, maybe a budget bid for next year. If we look at sort of through our doubling nature strategy, is this one of the areas that we want to look at? And part of that could be about doing things differently. And it may be that there's another little bit of money that we're looking at as well and that could be needed for, for some of this. Um, and the, the, the zero carbon grants for this time, which end in July, the end of July for this year, do have wild ha habitat enhancement as one of the um, categories. And as long as there's community engagement, but also it's looking at where there would be obviously carbon um, capture as well. So we'd need to look at that in terms of the riparian habitat what that does for carbon you know, have to link it somehow into that but it would seem to fit in with the community engagement the, the wildlife habitat enhancement and then we'd look at you know where you'd get the um carbon capture in that but that's open until 31st of july so maybe rob um could talk to that to some of the small you know the groups that are in south camps if they're interested in looking at it yeah. Trump's yeah. Gonna, can i gonna say something yeah can i suggest that emma uh dyer speaks with rob and then we speak to the group. So I think it's about making sure that we tailor who say what well, we don't want to spend is huge amounts of time on applications when we can make those as straightforward as possible. And the team is to make them straightforward. But I think Emma's on the call, so she'll take that. Um, if Emma and Rob speak, I think that will um, we can look at options, how we make that easier for those groups to um, to claim some of that money. Thank you. And it may not be that it's in this one, but we are looking at how we do the, the sort of doubling nature in terms of grants as well. So we're, we're looking at that as we go forward. So I don't know if anybody else, but Guy, thank you. That was fascinating. And it's great to know that we can actually yeah, do something in the 275 waterways that we manage, potentially. So that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we've got the green investments update, um, item number 11 with the Water Beach microgrid scheme. Is that you, Trevor? It is, yes. So this will be a very, very brief update. So all it's to say is um, whilst we've made the commitment that we're moving to an electric um, fleet over the next few years as we need to replace, we also now looking at how we actually charge those vehicles. So we are now looking about um, that can we use PV facilities to actually set up um, a microgrid to actually produce power on site and charge our vehicles um, with that. So we're looking at a couple of schemes. Um, one scheme that produces just enough energy for our use on, on, on site and another scheme that will maybe actually about producing surplus energy to be able to put back into the grid. So I think it's very early um, days at the moment, but I think this is the whole idea rather than just looking at um, electric vehicles as a, a solution. What we are trying to do is take that one stage further to actually produce or to move to electric vehicles, but knowing that they're being powered by um, green power and sustainable power. So the, the microgrid will look at what we need, when we need it in the daytime and what storage we need to put on, on board. So I think it's early, early process, but hopefully later in this year, we'll be able to 
um, bring you a sort of a bit more detail of the scheme at a large scale about how that might work. Yep, thank you very much. And that's a sort of part of the zero targets as well, zero carbon targets is one just to electrify the fleet, but then make sure it's green energy within that, isn't that? That was within the, the whole reductions that you were looking at in terms of the targets. Yeah, green on green on green, really. Yeah, fantastic. Any questions on that one? No, we're looking forward to hearing about that, that Trevor, definitely. Thank you very much. And Siobhan, um, in terms of the forward plan, agenda item number 12. Yes, I can just um, put this up on the screen. So we have, let's see. Can you see that now? Um, a bit bigger would be great. Is it a bit, bit bigger? Right. Okay. Let's see. Oops, it's a bit too big. Hang on. Yes. That's right. So there are quite a few items um, have been put forward for the 13th of July, um, principally the greenhouse gas emissions accounts and the progress report on the Zero Carbon Action Plan um, over the, the last year and a, the, the new action plan or the revised action plan, which will also include the doubling nature actions. Um, an upgrade on grid capacity issues um, facing Greater Cambridge, which Emma Davis has um, agreed to do. Uh, a speaker on valuing social and, environment and environmental benefits in investments. Um, who that will be is, is, is yet to be decided. Hatton Road attenuation ponds, which is an item from Lee Hillam. I'm not sure quite what that is. Trevor might be able to say. Um, A428 environmental legacy. Just a quick update on that. Report on the local energy advice project, which has been um, postponed from this session as it um, as Chris wasn't available. And then the usual green investments update. Thanks very much. And I think on the A428 environmental legacy update, that was really for us to, to know that, um, that whether, whether we really are seeing the you know, higher standards coming through from Highways England um, with all the lessons learned from A14 as well, that, that that's happening within that environmental legacy um, program. And, and to exert any pressure and influence that we can so that it's improved. Yeah. Okay, any other things that you'd like to see on the agenda coming forward? Not necessarily for the next one, but things that we can sort of build up for a future meeting. You can always fill, feed those in anywhere, anytime. Okay, thanks so much, Siobhan, for that and for all your work in helping prepare the meeting. Um, and it's 4.30, everybody say thank you. So, just, just uh, can we get the committee possibly to agree an extra meeting for Wednesday, the 22nd of September, to discuss the local plan? In fact, I put it on the uh, on the programme meeting. Yes. So if we can agree, everybody, that we do want to be able to know what's happening with the local plan. That's huge for us in terms of really um, achieving a lot of the aspirations that we have and making sure that they're embedded within the local plan. So, as as a committee, having an early sight on that um, that would be about the spatial framework. I think, won't it? The strategy that's coming forward. So Wednesday, twenty second of September, two p.m. Okay. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much and thank you everybody for joining us.